and this uh, lecture I will cover the MIPS floating point instructions and examples. Um, recall from last uh, lecture that I introduced the uh, MIPS floating point coprocessor. So it was called coprocessor back in the 1980s when MIPS was introduced because at that time it did not really fit on the same chip. So it was a separate chip. It was called a coprocessor. Today it is called a floating point unit and it can fit uh, inside the same uh, CPU chip. In fact, you can have many of these floating point units inside the same chip. So, um, so there are 32 separate floating point registers okay, inside coprocessor 1. Let us just use the word coprocessor 1. Uh, so these are F0, F1 to F31. Uh, the floating point registers are 32 bits for single precision numbers. So here I'm covering only the 32 bit architecture in which the floating point registers are 32 bits. If you want to store a double precision floating point number, you have to use a pair of registers. OK, an even odd pair of registers. So you can use these uh, 32 floating point registers to store 32 bit single precision floating point numbers or you can use them as 16 pairs of registers to store double precision floating point registers. So when you are using them as double precision registers, you refer to them as their even numbers. So F0, F2, F4, and F30. So F0 will be F0, F1, F2 will be F2, F3, and F30 will be F30 and F31. Now there are separate instructions for single precision and for double precision. And for example, add.s, it means that we are going to add single precision floating point numbers. Add.d, it means that we are going to add double precision floating point numbers. Now, these floating point instructions are more complex than the integer ALU instructions that we have seen okay, in the previous lectures. And of course, they occupy more area on the chip. This is why in the past it was called a coprocessor, and you have to buy a separate chip, okay, specifically for the floating point unit. But in the 1990s, uh, they were able to, the technology improved, and they were able to integrate the coprocessor inside the same chip, so it became just a unit, a floating point unit, okay? Now, let us take a look here at the arithmetic instructions. So the floating point arithmetic instructions are shown in this slide. So we have add.s, it means that we add single precision float. We have add.d, it means that we add double precision floating point numbers. We have subtract.s, we have subtract.d, we have multiplication, we have division, we have square root, we have the absolute value and we have negate. Now notice that uh, addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division, they operate, there are two source registers here, F3 and F4, and the destination here is F5. Whereas in the case of square root, absolute, and negate, there is only one source register, which is F3, and the destination here is F5. Notice that there is one opcode, which is this. So the same opcode is used by all of these instructions, by all the floating point instructions. So it is 0x11 in hexadecimal. If you see this opcode, it means that this is a floating point instruction. There is a unique function code, okay, for each one of these uh, arithmetic uh, floating point instructions. Uh, there is also a format. Notice that the format here, one zero indicates that this is single precision, whereas the format one one in hexadecimal, it indicates that this is a double precision floating point uh, 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 instruction. OK, so the format indicates whether it is single precision or double precision. So FS is my first source register. FT is my second source register and FD is my destination register. Notice that these fields are slightly different from the fields which are used in the R type format, but um, otherwise it's very similar to the R type format. 
Okay, so the place of FS, FD, and FD are slightly different in the case of floating point instructions. Notice that uh, for square root, absolute, and negate, then we don't really need a second source uh, register. Okay, so notice that FT here is zero. This field is not used, okay, in the case of square root, absolute, and negate. All what we are using, we are using here FS, which is the source. We only have one source register, and this is FD, which is the destination register. Uh, absolute and negate are very simple instructions. Absolute is going to make the sign that of the floating number equal to zero, so therefore it's going to obtain the absolute value, whereas negate, it's going to just to uh, toggle or invert the sign bit of the floating point number. So if it's positive, it becomes negative. If it is negative, it becomes positive. So this is negation. Uh, so, so these are the floating point arithmetic instructions. In addition to these, we have floating point load and store. So one would like to transfer data from memory into floating point registers. We need to use the floating point load and store instructions. So these have uh, the following names. We have load word coprocessor one. So coprocessor one, again, is the floating point unit. So therefore we are loading. Uh, so load word, it means that you are loading a single precision, a four bytes from memory, single precision float into a floating point register. Whereas load double, it means that you are loading eight bytes from memory. We are transferring eight bytes into a pair of floating point registers. We also have store word coprocessor one, and we have store double <coughs> coprocessor one. OK, so uh, this, these are going to transfer four bytes or eight bytes. So in the case of store double, we are going to store a pair of floating point registers in memory. Now notice that these are of the immediate byte. So each one has a unique opcode. Each one of these instructions has a unique opcode. Uh, notice that the addressing mode is identical to all the uh, load and store instructions. So here, for example, we are using T0, which is a general purpose register. It's used as the base address, and this immediate is used as the displacement. So notice that here RS, okay, is uh, my base. Uh, it's a source register that contains the base address, and immediate here is my displacement. So in the case of load word processor one, we are loading, we are transferring four bytes from memory at the specified address into the destination register F2. In the case of store word coprocessor one, we are going to transfer in the opposite direction. So therefore, we are going to transfer the value of F2 into memory. So four bytes are being transferred. Notice here the four indicating that four bytes are being transferred. In the case of load double coprocessor one, we are going to transfer. So even though we are specifying only F2 in the instruction, notice that here F, FT is F2. This field here is F2. We are transferring into a pair of registers, F2 and F3. So therefore, eight bytes are being transferred from memory into a pair of registers. And in the case of store double coprocessor one, we are transferring eight bytes from a pair of registers, F2 and F3, into memory. Notice the direction of the arrow, and eight bytes are being transferred. Okay, so, so remember that load and store use the base displacement addressing, so the address is specified in a general purpose register, okay, to specify the base address, and the displacement is just an immediate constant. So these are the load these are the floating point load and store instructions. In addition to these, we need data movement instructions. So these data movement instructions are going to transfer data or to copy data, okay, from a general purpose into a floating point and vice versa. So we have moved from coprocessor one. We also have moved to coprocessor one. So in the case of move from coprocessor one, we are going to copy the value of a floating point register, like for example, F2, into a general purpose register, which is T0. So T0 here is my destination 
and F2 is my source. On the other hand, in the case of move to coprocessor one, the direction is different. So therefore, we are going to copy the value of T0 into F2. So here T0 is my source and uh, sorry. Yes, so T0 is my source and F2 is my destination. Notice that the opcode is the same. This is the same opcode for all floating point instructions, okay, which is used in these data movement instructions. We also have move.s and move.d. So move.s is going to copy, okay, uh, uh, it's going to transfer data between two floating point registers. So single precision, it means that we are going to copy one source. Notice that here fs is my source. Uh, floating point register and FD is my destination, or we can actually also use move.d. So this is going to copy a pair of registers. Precision. So an even odd pair of registers is being transferred. So we're going to transfer here F2, F3 into F4, F5. So this is a double precision. Double precision means it's going to occupy a pair of registers. Now, I just would like to here to draw your attention that there are implementations okay, of the MIPS architecture in which all the floating point registers are 64 bit. So this is called a 64 bit architecture in which the floating point register is 64 bits. We don't really need a pair of registers to store a double precision floating point number because the register itself can hold, can contain uh, 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 a double precision floating point number. So here I'm talking about the 32 bit architecture in which the floating point registers are only 32 bit, and therefore a single register can contain single precision float, and you need a pair of registers to store, okay, a double precision float. Right. The next, uh, so these are called data movement instructions. Right. Uh, uh, in addition to these, we still also have other instructions. Here we have the convert instructions. Now the question is here is that how do I add, let us say, a single precision float to a double precision float? What we have seen in a previous slide is that how I can add single precision with single precision. I can add double precision with double precision, but I cannot add there is no add instruction that can add single precision to a double precision. So in order to do this kind of addition, what you have to do is that you have to use a convert instruction. You can convert the instruction from single precision to double precision, and then after that, you can add a double to a double. Okay, so, uh, so this is why we need these convert instructions. So the convert instruction has the following syntax. It is convert dot X dot Y. So here dot X is my destination format. So we write the destination format X, whereas dot Y is my source format. That's the source format Y. Now the MIPS architecture supports three formats. It supports single precision float. It supports double precision float. So dot S here means single precision dot D means double precision float, and it also supports a signed integer, which is a word, just a word, okay, which is only four bytes. So it supports a signed integer word, which is the dot W, okay? So we use, the, we use dot W to indicate that it is a signed integer. So you can, so what you have to do is that you can, okay, you have to have OK, a single precision or a double precision or a signed integer in a floating point register before you do the conversion. Now you can copy a signed integer from, let us say, uh, a general purpose register into, uh, let us say, uh, a floating point register, and then you can convert it. For example, if you would like to add an integer, OK, to a, let us say, to a single precision float, you have to convert the signed integer into a floating point number into the floating point binary representation according to the IEEE 7.5.4 standard. So you convert the representation of the integer into a floating point number, and then you can add, okay, a single precision. Okay, you can actually add them as single precision floating point numbers. So in order to do this, 
we can use the convert instruction. For example, convert.s.w. This is going to convert a signed integer, which is in F4, into a floating point, into a single precision floating point number, and it's going to write the result in F2. So F2 is my destination, F4 is my source, and notice that the conversion is from the word to signed integer. Okay, so, sorry, from, from word into a single precision float. So S here means single precision float. Okay, so we convert the word into a single precision float and we write the result into F2. Notice the same opcode, which is used for all floating point instructions. Now the format is different here for, for word. So uh, the MIPS architecture uses 0x14 in hexadecimal to specify that you are converting a word into single precisions. Notice here the function, okay, which indicates that you would like to convert it. So this is actually a function for conversion. And the source here is F4 is, and my destination is F2. Notice that this field here is not being used and therefore we just keep it zero. Now, the same thing can be said here by converting double into single precision. Okay, so you can use here convert.s.d. So this is going to convert F4, F5. So notice that double is going to occupy a pair of registers. So therefore we, we convert it as F4, F5 into F2. So here my source consists of a pair of registers and my destination is just F2. So this is going to, uh, uh, when we convert it from double precision to single precision, we lose precision. So therefore we are converting it from 64 bits to only 32 bits, floating point number. Now this is important, for example, when you would like to reduce the precision of a, of a double precision into single precision. You can also convert from word into double precision. So this is convert.d.w. So my destination will be a pair of registers. So you are converting an integer into double precision. You can convert from single precision to double precision. So this way you can extend the precision. Okay, this will be useful, for example, when you would like to add single precision to a double precision. So first you extend the precision from single to double by doing this convert instruction, and then you can add it as double precision to a double precision. Okay. So F4 here is single precision, but dot D here is double precision. Notice the format. Okay, so notice the format here that this is the format of the source. So here, okay, one zero means single precision. Here, one one is means double precision. One four means an integer word. This is the importance of the format. Uh, and so on. You can convert uh, single precision into a word. So this will round the floating point number into a signed integer. You can also convert double precision float, uh, double precision floating point number into a signed integer. So you can see that my destination here is a word, but the word is written into a floating point register. So this way you can round it into the nearest integer. And of course, once you have the integer into a floating point register, you can transfer it, you can copy it, you can move it into a general purpose register, or you can store it in memory if you want. Okay, so, so these are the convert instructions. Okay, and you can convert between these three different supported uh, formats. In addition to these, we also have floating point compare and the branch instructions. So how do we compare floating point numbers? And how do we branch based on the result of this comparison? So we have compare instructions. So C here means compare, whereas in the previous slide, we use CVT to means convert. Okay, so notice the difference in the syntax of the, these instructions. So C means compare. So we can compare for equality. We can compare for less than. We can compare for less than or equal. Um, we can compare single precision float. So dot S means single precision float. We can compare dot D means double precision float. So we can compare single precision floats. We can compare double precision floats. Now, the result of comparison is either true or false. So rather than using a floating point register to store the result of this comparison, the way that the MIPS architecture does it for floating point numbers, it uses condition codes. 
eight condition codes. So each condition code is just a single bit flag. It is a flag that can be either one or zero. And the MIPS architecture defines eight condition codes so that you can use them as the target of a floating point compare instruction. So when you would like to compare two floating point numbers, at the say F2 and F4, you place the result in a condition code flag. Here, CC means a condition code flag. Think about CC as a single bit register. And we have eight of these, which are numbered from zero to seven. So therefore you can write the result of a compare instruction in uh, as a flag inside the floating point unit, inside the floating point register in the floating point unit. So here FS and FT are my source registers I would like to compare. CC here is my condition code, which is the target, which is where I would like to store the result of this comparison. And here you notice that the opcode is identical. It's just 0x11 okay, for all floating point uh, compare instructions. And notice that the function, okay, how it's defined for these compare instructions. Now notice the format indicates single precision or double precision. So this is the, um, the format of these instructions. So we have for equality, we have uh, 3.2 for equality, for less than we have 3C, and we have 3E here for less than or equal. Now after we do the comparison, we can branch. We can branch based on this condition code. We can branch if the condition code is false, we can branch if it is true. So we have two branch instructions, branch if false, branch if true. Now C1 here means coprocessor one. It means that the, we are branching on a condition code which is in the floating point unit. So notice that you can specify here the CC, which is the condition code flag that we would like to branch. So we can branch if this condition code flag is zero, we can branch if it is one. So this is why we have the branch if F, F here means false, it means it's equal to zero, and T means it is true, it means that this condition code flag is one. Now notice that I don't really have compare not equal, because compare not equal, if you are testing for equality and you get actually zero, it means that they are not equal. So you can use a branch if false after using compare for equality. So this way there is no need for the other compare instructions because you have here branch if false. You can branch if the condition code is false. You can also branch if it is true, if they are equal. So for this reason, because we have these two branch instructions, there is no need to have branch. We don't really need actually to compare Okay, for not equal. There is no compare for a greater than or equal because not less than okay, will be greater than or equal. And not less than or equal will be strictly greater than. So for this reason, we don't really have these additional compare instructions. So these are sufficient because we can branch if the condition code is false or true. Notice that uh, the branch instructions use a label. Okay, it is PC relative addressing. So there is a 16 bit offset. So the 16 bit offset here is used to uh, calculate the target of the branch exactly the same way that we have the other branch instructions. OK, so the, the branch instructions use PC relative addressing and therefore we use the 16 bit immediate in the branch instruction OK for branching. OK, so, so we add the 16 bit immediate. Notice that remember that how we did it for PC relative addressing. Right. So, so th these are the floating point compare and the branch instructions. You can use them, okay, for example, for translating statements when you would like to compare floating point numbers and you would like to branch accordingly. Uh, notice that how the compare is separated from the branch. So unlike the branch if equal and not branch not equal, which are used to compare integers, and branch accordingly. So branch if equal and the branch not equal, they combine the compare. So they so they compare the comparison. So they compare and branch in the same instruction. 
Now here you have to separate the compare from the branch. So first you compare and then you branch. OK, so you have to do it with two different instructions because comparing floating point numbers is slightly more complex than comparing integers. So for this reason, they separated the comparison from the branching. So they did it differently for floating point numbers. I have two examples. The first example about how to calculate the area of a circle. This is just simple input output. So the area of a circle is equal to pi r squared. So we're going to ask the user to input the radius. We're going to read the radius. We're going to calculate pi multiplied by r squared, and then we're going to output the area. So I'm going to define here pi, okay, in my data. So in my data segment, notice that pi is of type double. So therefore, it's going to occupy eight bytes in memory, and it is given here in decimal. So this decimal number here, 3.14159, etc. So as double precision, you can actually have many digits after the decimal point. In fact, that double precision, you can even have like 16 significant digits in total. So you have one before the decimal point, and you can actually have like 15 digits after the decimal point. Now, this is shown in decimal in the assembly language. What the assembler will do is going to take this number, which is shown in decimal, and convert it to binary, and then represented according to the IEEE 754 standard. Normalize it, okay? Get the biased exponent, store the biased exponent, the fraction inside the double precision binary floating point number and store it in memory inside the static area of the uh, data segment. So pi is just a constant and you are defining it in the data segment. Another thing which is shown here is message. Message is just a string, okay, which is shown here. Circle area is equal to. Notice that I'm using the directive here, ASCII Z. OK, the Z indicates that there is an extra null character that marks the end of my string. OK, so my code is very simple here. It is just a main function that starts here at main. I'm going to load the constant pi from memory. So I'm going to use here load double coprocessor one. You can write it like this pi. OK. Uh, so therefore, this is going to use the address okay, of the constant pi in memory to load its value into F2. But because we are using load double, it's going to load into a pair of registers, F2 and F3. Okay, because a floating point register here can only store single precision. So you need a pair okay, to store the value of pi because pi is double precision. Okay, it needs a pair of registers. Now, after that, I would like to ask the user, OK, to enter the value of radius. Of course, you can print a prompt, OK, a string that will ask the user enter the radius. But I did not do it here because I just would like to keep the code to fit in a single slide. I will need more instructions to print uh, uh, the string, but there is no space in this slide. So I'm going to just to ask the user. So I'm going just to read it double. From the keyboard. So to read the double, you have to use system code number seven. So I'm going to initialize V0 with seven. Seven here means read double according to the list of system codes which are provided by the Mars tool. And then issue the system code instruction. So the system call is going to read, okay, a double precision floating point number from the keyboard. Of course, the, the user is going to type the digits, okay, of this number. OK, he's going to enter, for example, let us say a decimal point because the radius can be can have a fraction. Uh, you might also use the exponent, the E scientific notation, the E. You can actually have a positive or a negative exponent. So this is going to be read from the keyboard. So the user is going to type the uh, keys, OK, enter the digits. And then after that, the system call is going to convert it from characters, from its string representation 
into a double precision flow into the binary representation. So this is done by the system code. So the system code actually converts the input into a double precision floating point number in its binary representation. And it's going to return the result in F0 and F1. So this is the value of radius. Now remember that seven here is the system call for reading double precision. So therefore we need a pair of registers to return the value that was read from the keyboard. OK, so that's the value of radius. OK, and it will be stored in binary according to the IEEE 7.4 representation. Now, once we have the value of radius in F0 and F1, notice that the system call, before I continue, notice that the system call is going to return the result in F0 and F1. Uh, this is the same thing, OK, than that returning an integer in V0. So here, OK, for floating point numbers, F0 and F1 will be similar to V0 and V1, OK, which are used for integers. So if you would like, for example, to write a function and you would like to return a result of this function, OK, so the convention in the MIPS architecture to use F0 and F1 to return the result of a function. And the same thing actually for a system call, we just return the result in F0 and F1 because these are just floating point. This is a floating point number. Now, after that, what I need to do is that I need to calculate the area. I need to multiply radius by radius multiplied by pi. So let us multiply radius by radius. So radius now is uh, a double precision floating point number. So notice that how we write it, mul dot d, okay, because we are going to multiply it as double precision. I'm going to multiply F0 with F0. Of course, this will multiply F0, F1 with F0, F1, because remember that it's double precision. We write it F0, but really we are multiplying a pair of registers by itself. And we, we place the result here in F12. Now the result is also double precision and it's going to occupy a pair of registers, F12 and F13. We always refer to the even numbered registers, okay, when we are dealing with double precision, okay, floating point numbers. After that, I'm going to multiply it with pi. So pi exists in F2. Already we have loaded this into F2. So I multiply it by F12 and place the result in F12. Now we have already calculated uh, the value of the area and we have the result in F12. Now what I really need to do is that I need now to print it. Okay, just I would like to show the area, the circle area. Before I print the value, I'm going to print the string. So I'm going to, here I would want to print circle area is equal to. So I'm going to load the address of the message into A0 and use system call number four initialized in V0 to print the string. So this is going to print the string circle area is equal to. And then after, so this is my system call to print the string. And then after that, I would like to print the double. So to print the double, you have to use system call number three. So system call number three is going to print the double. The double has to exist in F12 and F13. So this is why when we computed the area, we place the result in F12 and F13. So when we do the system call, this is going to print the value, okay, of F12, F13 is going to appear on your screen. Again, the system call is going to do the conversion from binary into its decimal representation and show you the value in decimal. So this is, was my first example, how to calculate the area of a circle. It's a very simple example. An example which is a lot more interesting and of course more complex is matrix multiplication. So here I would like to multiply two matrices and place the result in a third matrix. So I'm going to write a function, okay, which is called MM here. MM means matrix multiplication. Now this function has four arguments. Now the first argument here is N. N here is the number of rows and number of columns in my matrix. And then here I have three matrices, X, Y, and Z. Okay. Now notice that the type of each element here is a float. 
It means that these are single precision floating point elements inside the matrix X, Y, and Z. Now I'm using here my own syntax indicating that X here is N by N, the same thing for Y and the same thing for Z. So these are the square matrices. Now this is not exactly the syntax of the C programming language. If you would like to write in C, you have to indicate that X is a pointer. So you write the star. You don't specify the number of rows and columns. You just specify it as X itself as a pointer. So really, OK, when you would like to pass the matrix of a function, you don't really pass the entire matrix. You only pass the address of the matrix. So that's how we are going to translate it into assembly. We are going to pass the address of, of the matrix X, the address of the matrix Y, and the address of the matrix C. So these matrix addresses will exist in A1, A2, and A3. So notice that A0 is N. A1 here is the address of the matrix X. A2 is the address of the matrix Y. And A3 is the address of the matrix Z. So the question is, how do I translate okay, matrix multiplication? How do I translate this function, which is written in a high-level programming language, okay, into... So the syntax of the body of the function is just a C syntax. But as I said, the way that I wrote the parameters, X, Y, and Z, okay, they should... The syntax is different in, in C. You have to write... You have to use the pointer, okay? So you, you have to use the pointer syntax so you write float star x you don't write here and n okay so uh, the syntax is different from for the parameters but the syntax of the body is exactly the same uh, so how do we translate okay this function which is written in a high level programming language into assembly uh, notice that uh, this function is not really simple okay it has three nested for loops I have, this is my outer four, this is my middle four, and this is my inner four loop. So it's written as three nested four loops. I'm using here for the outer loop, I'm using here I. I'm using I here as a counter to count the number of iterations in the outer four loop. So I will go from zero to N minus one. So as long as I is not equal to N, here I plus plus, we just actually increment the value of I. So basically, we repeat n times in the outer for loop. I'm going to repeat also n times. I'm using a different index, which is j. j is used here for the middle loop. Again, we are going to repeat n times. You can see that j here is not equal to n. So we go from 0 to n minus 1, j plus plus. And then I have here my inner loop. I'm using k here for my inner loop. Again, k is less is, is not equal to n, or you can write uh, k is less than n, and then k equal to k plus one. So basically, we just increment the index. So I'm going to repeat n times for the inner loop. So we have n multiplied by n multiplied by n. We have n cube. That's actually how many times we are going to execute this statement here, which is inside the inner loop. Now that's matrix multiplication. It's a well-known procedure which is given in high-level programming languages. It's a procedure which is frequently uh, in, in, in algebra, in linear algebra, okay, when we operate on matrices. So this is really a really a common function. Now the way it works, we really need to understand what's really happening inside okay, this function. Okay, uh, this is shown in the next slide. OK, I'm going to show you the access pattern for matrix multiplication. So I would like to multiply two matrices, matrix Y with matrix C, and put the result in matrix X. In order to do this, I'm going to multiply every row of matrix Y with every column of matrix Z. So we have N rows in Y. We have N columns in Z. Now, every multiplication is a dot product. It's called the dot product. It means that we multiply a row by a column, but we get a single value. Okay, so when you multiply, for example, this row, which is shown in blue, by this column, which is shown in orange, we get just one element in the matrix X. Okay, so this is called a dot 
product. It's called a dot product. It means that you multiply a row by a column. So the way that you multiply them is that you accumulate the sum and then the final sum is written as just a single element in the matrix X. This is actually how it's written in the high level programming language. Before I enter my inner loop, I'm going to initialize sum to 0, 0.0. Notice that it's of type float because this is the type of the elements. And then I'm going to enter this inner loop. Notice that inside this inner loop, I'm going to multiply y i k multiplied by z k j. Notice that k is changing from 0 to n minus 1. Notice that i and j are fixed inside the inner loop. What is changing is only k is changing. So by changing k and fixing i and j, this will multiply row i by column j. Okay? And k is changing. So when you fix i and you change k, you traverse all the elements of row i inside the matrix y. By fixing j and changing k, you traverse all the elements of column j inside the matrix z. So the matrix z is accessed by column, whereas the matrix y is accessed by row. So this is what we call the access pattern based on the indices. By understanding these indices, you understand, OK, how you are accessing the matrix Y and the matrix Z. Now, when you do this, you accumulate the sum as shown here in the high level uh, function is that you say that sum is equal to sum plus, OK, this product. So by accumulating the sum here in a single variable, which is called sum here, you finish the inner loop. So the inner loop is going to multiply only one row of y, which is row at index i, by one column of z, which is at index j, at column index j, to, to produce one sum. So after you finish the execution of this for loop, you store the sum in x i j. So we have we have multiplied one row, which is row i, okay, of y by one column of z to produce this tiny element, which is just this orange element of the matrix X. So this will be uh, the element at row index I and column index J, okay? So this is just one element of X, which is shown here in orange, okay? That will be the result of the dot product of multiplying row I by column J. Now notice that the outer, the, the outer and the middle loops are going to repeat over all i's and all j's. So therefore, we repeat over all the rows of y and over all the columns of j to produce n squared elements inside the matrix X. Okay, so that's basically matrix multiplication. Now let us translate this into assembly. Okay, the first thing I'm going to do in order to translate this into assembly, remember the parameters are passed in A0, A1, A2, and A3. And remember that A1, A2, and A3 are just the addresses, okay, of the matrix X, matrix Y, and matrix Z. The first thing I'm going to do is that I'm going to translate these three nested for loops. Okay, so let us do this here quickly in assembly language as shown here. So this uh, this procedure or this function, sorry, this matrix multiplication procedure cannot really fit on one slide. I have to write on three different slides. Okay, so it's going to start here at this label. So this is actually is the label for my procedure for my matrix multiplication procedure. Now this procedure expects four arguments. A zero will be the value of n. That will indicate how many rows and how many columns you have, okay, in each matrix. A1 will be just simply the address, the base address of the matrix X. A2 will be the address of Y, and A3 will be the address of Z. We are multiplying Y by Z and placing the result in memory. So remember that these matrices exist in memory. So we have to load the values of their elements, and we have to write, store the value of the matrix X in memory. The first step I'm going to do is that I'm going to look at the outer, the middle, and the inner loop and translate the structure of these loops. So let us do this first. Before I load and store, let us actually just translate the outer for loop, the middle for loop, 
and the inner for loop. Now notice that here I say for i equal to zero. This initialization of i equal to zero is done once outside the for loop. Okay, so I'm going to use here in my translation, I'm going to use the temporary register T1. So I'm going here to use T1 for I. So and this is initialized to zero. Now notice that I'm going to initialize T1 to zero, which is basically my index I, before I enter my outer for loop. So this is done once. Now I'm going to initialize T2. I'm going to use T2 for J. So T2 here will be used for J. It's very important that actually you comment, okay, the use of these registers, okay, so that you remember that this register is being used for this variable, okay? So you can remember that what you have done because it's really hard to, when you are programming in assembly, okay, to just to look at the assembly language code and understand it. Assembly really is difficult, okay? We are doing this only for the sake of understanding assembly language. All programming today is done in a high level programming language. It's the task of the compiler writer, okay, to allocate registers. Okay, the compiler will allocate registers, okay, for these variables. So here we are doing the job of the compiler, okay? But really the compiler does this automatically for us. So we have to appreciate really compilers, okay? Because compilers do all the translation today, okay? So they simplify our task as programmers. If we did not really have high level programming languages, we did not really have compilers, we have to do all of this in assembly. But we are doing it here just for the sake of learning assembly language. OK, so now. I'm using here T2 for J. Notice that I'm initializing T2 to zero before I enter my middle loop. I'm using here L1 as a label for my outer loop. I'm using L2 as my label for my middle loop. And finally, I'm going to use here T3 for K. That will be T3 and it's initialized to zero before I enter here my inner loop. So inner loop here will start at L3. Now this is basically the structure. These are my three nested loops. Let us see how we increment the value of K. The value of K is incremented inside the inner loop. So notice that this add IU is going to increment the value. We just add one to T3. We just actually say that K is equal to K plus one. So this is actually is my add immediate instruction that's going to increment the value of K. And then I'm going to have this branch to loop back to L3. So as long as here T3 is not equal to N, remember that A0 contains the parameter N, okay? So we have to repeat this N times. So this is actually where my loop, and this is actually the end of my inner loop. This branch instruction, Okay, marks the end of my inner loop. So we branch here to L3. Now, after we finish the execution of the uh, inner loop, we go back here to my middle loop. So notice that this add IU is going to increment J by one. Okay, so notice that here T2 is actually incremented by one, and we use this branch here to branch to L2. So branch if J is not equal to N. Okay, so T2 here is J and A0 is N. So we branch here. So this branch instruction marks the end of my middle for loop. And finally, I have this add IU that is going to increment T1 by one. This is I equal to I plus one. And then I branch if T1 is not equal to A0. So if I is not equal to N. And I'm going to branch to L1, which is the outer loop. So this will be the end of my outer loop. And once we are done with the outer loop, I return back to the caller. Okay, so that's actually my jump register, and RA will contain my return address. Right. So, so this is the structure, okay, of these three nested for loops. But still, we did not really do the work here. We still have to load the value of YIK. I still need to load the value of ZKJ. I have to accumulate the sum. And then after I finish the execution of my inner for loop, I have to store my sum in XIJ in memory. Now, in order to load or in order to store, we have to do address calculation. That's the importance of address calculation. We have to calculate the address of YIK 
I have to calculate the address of ZKJ and I have to calculate the address of XIJ. That's the importance of address calculation. Right, so, um, so let us take a look here, okay, at uh, the access pattern, okay, for matrix multiplication. So now we look at the address calculation. We look at the address of I, uh, the address of XIJ. We have to go back to um, the lecture about arrays to understand, okay, how we calculate the address of XIJ. The address of XIJ is the address of X plus I multiplied by N because we have N elements in each row. And then we add to it J, which is the column index, and everything is multiplied by four because we have four byte elements. So each element in my matrix here is a four byte uh, element. Okay, so, uh, so this is how we do address calculation. We do the same thing here for the address of YIK, y, but here actually my column index is K, it's not J. And finally, the address of ZKJ. Now here, my row index here is K, it's not I. And my column index here is J. So notice that how we, we write, okay, these, this is how we do address calculation. Okay, so after we have done this kind of address calculation, Okay, you can say that, okay, there is a pattern in which we are accessing all the elements, okay, uh, in the matrix, the matrix Y and the matrix Z. Can this be simplified? Now, notice that here when I multiply I by N, I need the multiply instruction. I need uh, an addition here. I need a shift left to multiply by four. I need another addition. So this will take many instructions in programming in assembly. There is a better way for address calculation, understanding how these elements are traversed in memory. So when you traverse elements which are contiguous in memory, and for example, after finishing the computation of this uh, orange element in XIJ, and I move to the green element, these are after each other. They are contiguous in memory. And therefore, if I would like to go here, if I if I knew the address of x i j minus one, that would be the address of the previous element. Just add to it four four bytes to calculate the address of x i j. So therefore, I can relate the address of uh, the address of the matrix element, okay, x i j, to the address of the previous element, which is at index i j minus one. So it's the same row i, but it's the previous column. The same thing actually here when you look at all the elements in the same row, you can always relate the address of YIK to the address of the previous element. Okay, it's the same row I, but the previous index, which is K minus one. All what you have to do is just add four because you are traversing all the elements, okay, of the matrix Y, you are traversing them, okay, row by row, and these elements are contiguous inside the same row. So this is called row major ordering. It means that the matrix is stored row by row in memory. Now, the difficult part is for matrix Z. Why? Because I'm accessing the elements of the matrix Z by column, not by row. So therefore, when I would like to go from one element to the next element okay, in the same column, I have to skip N elements because there are N elements in each row so I have to skip n elements. So therefore each, so n elements multiplied by four bytes, it will be four multiplied by n. So therefore to actually to compute the address of ZKJ, knowing the address of the previous element in the same column, which is the address of ZK minus one J, that will be the address of the previous element in the same column, you have to add four multiplied by n because you have to skip four multiplied by n bytes. So you have to skip n elements that exist, okay, because we have n elements in each row to access, okay, the next element in the same column. So understanding this kind of address calculation is essential for assembly language programming. Now here you appreciate the job of the compiler because the compiler does this automatically for you. So let us finish this function. We are not really done yet. So what I have to do before I enter, okay, my inner loop, I have to 
initialize sum to zero, and then I have to calculate this sum inside my for loop. But in order to calculate this sum inside my for loop, I have to know the value of y, i, k, and z, k, j. So let us do this. So before I enter here, okay, uh, my inner loop, so I'm still here in the middle loop. In the middle loop, what you have to do is that you have to initialize sum to 0, 0.0. So I'm going to initialize it in F0. Now, one way to do it is that you can move, okay, the value of register 0. So move to coprocessor 1, I can move here F0. Okay, so I can move it to coprocessor 1, I can move the value of register 0, the general purpose register, into the floating point register F0. Now, F0 is not, in, it's not hardwired to 0, but you can copy, okay, the value of register 0 into F0 using move to coprocessor 1. So this is basically transferring the value of a general purpose register into a floating point register. So this way we have initialized F0 to 0. We're going to use F0, okay, to accumulate this sum. Now I need to do this before I enter my inner loop. So notice that we do the initialization of sum before I enter here for k equal to 0, the inner loop. Now once we have done this initialization, now I can enter my inner loop. Now in my inner loop, what I need to do is that I need to load the value of yik. I need to load the value of zkj. So I'm going to use t4 and t5. Now t4 will contain the address of yik and t5 will contain the address of zkj. Assuming that we have already initialized the value of t4 and t5, we have the, their addresses in t4 and t5, I can load the value into F1 and F2. I'll talk about how we can actually do this kind of, how you, you do address calculation in a minute. So assuming that the address of YIK exists in T4, and assuming that the address of ZKJ exists in T5, you can use, you can load their value. So load word coprocessor one is going to load a floating point number, okay, from memory at this specified address into floating point register. So we use F1 as the value of YIK, and I use F2 as the value of ZKJ. I still need to multiply them, so mal.s, because these are single precision. So multiply F1 by F2, place the result in F3, and then add to accumulate the sum. So F0 becomes F0 plus F3. So we have accumulated this sum in F0. Now I need, to increment T4, notice that inside the inner loop, I need to increment T4 by 4. Now, why do I need to increment T4 by 4? Because I need to point to the next, I need to point to the next uh, uh, address, okay, the next element inside the same row, okay? So basically, it's just the next element in memory. What I have to do is just to advance the pointer or the address by four to point to the next element inside the same row. Whereas in the case of the address of uh, ZKJ, I need to point to the next element in the, uh, uh, so it's in the, in, the, in the column. So therefore we have to, add, we cannot advance it by four, we have to advance it by four times N. So we have to advance it by four. So therefore here T5, we add to T5, I add to T5, okay, T0. Now what is T0? Now T0 here, notice what I did is that at the beginning of my matrix multiplication function, I shifted left A0, which is N, by 2. So this will be N multiplied by 4 and place the result in T0. I did it once at the beginning of my matrix multiplication function. So I computed this once because it's not related to any computation inside the outer middle or the inner loop. So I did it outside the outer loop. So now T0 is actually N multiplied by 4. So now when we advance here, sorry, in the inner loop, when we advance here the address in T5, I advance it by n multiplied by 4. So this is the value of T0. So this is my inner loop. Right. Before I, okay, so this is my inner loop. Now when I finish my inner loop, let me just continue after finishing the loop. What I need to do is that I need to store my computed sum. So now my computed sum exists in F0. Okay, so go back to the high level, okay, source code. Okay, this is actually my, my high level function. 
I need to store the value of sum. Already we have computed the sum in F0. I have to store it in memory. So I need to know the address of x i j. So in order to do, I'm going to add, so so here the address of uh, x i j exists in a1. Now a1 initially contains the address, the base address of my matrix x. So I'm going to use store word coprocessor one. I'm going to store the value of f0, which is sum at the address. So initially we start at the first element in my matrix x. So when we store it, okay, and we are done, we can simply advance the address by four to point to the next element in memory. So you see, it's simple. It's really simple, okay, understanding in what order you are traversing the elements inside the matrix. So we are pointing to the next address. So therefore, I'm going to change the value of A1. I'm going to modify it to become A1 plus four, and therefore point to the next element to the next element in my matrix. Because basically the elements of the matrix are traversed sequentially, one by one in memory. So all what I need to do is just advance, okay, the address by just incrementing it by four, that's it. That's all what I need to store my sum, okay, in memory. So the store word coprocessor one is going to store the floating point register F0, which is my accumulated sum in memory. Right. What is needed, what is missing, okay, is that I need this T4 and T5. How did we actually compute this T4 and T5? I did not really mention this. I skipped this. So now I'm going to show you how we calculate this T4 and T5. Now, before I enter my inner loop, I'm going to copy the value of A2 into T4. So notice that this move instruction that's going to copy the value of A2 into T4. Now, A2 is the address of the matrix Y. I'm going to place it in T4. Now, I'm going to also do some kind of address calculation here. So this shift left logical instruction. So we use T2. Remember that T2 is nothing but J. Okay, so we're going to multiply J by four. So this is my shift left. Okay, so shift left T2 by two bits. This is multiplication by four. Place the result in T5 and add to T5 to A3. Remember that A3 is nothing but the address of Z. So this is going to start at the first element in column J. So basically what we have done is that we calculated the address of Z, zero, J. So A3 is the address of the matrix C, and then we add to it here J multiplied by four bytes because we have four bytes in each element. So this will give me the address of Z, zero, J. So we have to be row zero and column J. This is how we calculate the address. We place the address in T5. So I have calculated the address of the first element, element zero, okay, at index row index zero, but column index J, and I place the address in T5 before we enter the inner loop. And then we start changing here K. So when we change here K, we just increment T5 here. This add U here is going to modify T5 by adding T0, which is N multiplied by four, to compute the address of the next element inside the same column. Okay, so it's it's like this. This is actually how we do address calculation. Now notice that for uh, for T4, I started initially at A2, so that was initially the base address of the matrix Y. But when we go from one row to another row, notice that here. OK, after we finish the execution here of the middle loop, OK, before we go back to the outer loop, I'm going here to add to A2, I'm going to add T0. So basically we advance A2, OK, to point to the address of the next row because we do it row by row, right? So therefore we advance A2 to point to the address of the next row. So each row, has n elements and each element is four bytes. So we have added n multiplied by four. Remember that T0, okay, from this, so T0 is nothing but n multiplied by four because we have n elements in each row and each element is four bytes. 
So by adding here to A2, adding the value of T0, we are pointing to the address of the next row in memory. So this will be the address of Y I0. So we go here to row at index I, but we start at column zero. OK, so take your time to understand this code. I just explained it in details okay, in this, uh, in this uh, presentation, okay, in this video. Uh, I'm going to stop recording here. OK, so try. This is actually is my last slide okay, in this presentation. It's not really that simple, of course, if you are writing this code for the first time. But of course, with some practice, you will be able to write functions like that. OK, that have, let us say, nested loops and with address calculation. And here we are dealing with matrices. So address calculation is more complex when you are dealing with matrices. So thank you for watching. Uh, that's it uh, for today. Let me stop recording.